It's that time of year. We're seeing a ton of coaching movement across all of college football. And are the Ducks surging for a top transfer portal target? We'll talk about that on today's episode of the Ducks Dish Podcast. And we're back like we never left. Oregon fans, what's going on? How we living? Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Ducks Dish Podcast. Just in case you're new here, I'm your host, Max Torres, and we have a great episode in store for you guys today. It is Wednesday afternoon, January 17th, 2024. And we are coming to you wherever you can find your podcasts and on YouTube at Oregon Football Max Torres. I am so glad that I am not rolling solo today. I got my guy Spencer McLaughlin, the host of Locked on Ducks, joining me for today's episode. My guy, how the heck are you? Busy. Busy as can be. That's the that's the life we choose, though. I'd rather be busy than bored. That's very true. I can definitely agree with that sentiment, but we have some news to get into and then some more a uh, little transfer portal talk, maybe some broad picture stuff as well, but I know you are a busy guy, so thank you so much for taking some time to, to hop on the show. Leading things off, let's talk about the coaching movement on the Oregon side of things. We have Oregon cornerbacks coach Demetrius Martin uh, officially announced as the new cornerbacks coach for Michigan State as Jonathan Smith continues to build his staff out there in East Lansing. Uh, let's just kind of dig into some thoughts here with uh, Demetrius Martin headed to East Lansing. Yeah, Michigan State alum and a guy who I think did a really nice job for the Ducks over the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't realize that element of it that he went to MSU until today. So that certainly made it make some sense. But I think my, my other takeaway was if he's looking to one day become a defensive coordinator, and I don't know, I, I've, I've never talked to Coach Meat before. I don't know what his aspirations are and such. When you're a position coach at a Power 5 school, you are, are, are paid pretty solidly. But if he wants to move up, I don't think there was a path for him to do that at Oregon because Tosh Lupoy, I, I think, is staying with Dan Lanning. I don't think he would uh, go somewhere else. Chris Hampton, maybe. You know, Matt Zenitz of 24-7 Sports reported that he has turned down Power 5 DC offers to stay with Oregon, which is a testament to what Dan Lanning is building in Eugene right now. So, I think that he he was probably you know third on the pecking order, and if you have Landing in there fourth in terms of highest ranking defensive coaches, and he he might view the Michigan State opportunity as a way for him to have more upward mobility because Jonathan Smith brought his OC Brian Lindgren with him and other staff members from Oregon State. He did not bring Trent Bray. He stayed behind to be the Oregon State head coach. So, you know, whoever the D.C. hire is, I'm not sure if they've made it yet. I, I, I presume they have. I just don't know who it is off the top of my head. And whoever that is, I don't think there is going to be as much, uh, you know, familiarity or perhaps loyalty from Jonathan Smith's standpoint. So if, you know, Coach Meat shows himself to be uh, a really good coach in that regard, I, I think he could see more of an upward trajectory there. So I, I think those two factors are, are, are what drove the move that with his son transferring to Arizona State and when when he stayed put after that move I, I thought he was going to be sticking around but uh, uh, certainly we know that's not the case anymore uh, I, I think he's someone who was a really really good recruiter for for the ducks but there are still a lot of good recruiters on this staff uh, but you, you just look at the lineup of guys I mean Rod Pleasant and uh, Jalil Florence I think would be in in that conversation or was he he was before Dalen Austin yeah D Dalen Austin Ify Obadegwu um, D D Aaron Flowers just a lot of blue chip guys in that defensive backfield that uh, you know Kobe Savage coming over from Kansas State in the offseason via the transfer portal Evan Williams last year a lot of guys that that have been quality acquisitions and talented acquisitions and I, I think that's where he's he's been really really good and I expect him to be really good uh, at Michigan State. Demetrius Martin was certainly I think a, a really good asset for this Oregon football program during his time in Eugene you already alluded to his ability as a recruiter was actually named the 247 sports recruiter of the year for the Pac-12 in the 2023 cycle uh, helping the Ducks land Rod Pleasant, who you mentioned, Daylon Austin as well, Solomon Davis, uh, all from Southern California. And then you also have 
Demetrius Martin bringing over Christian Gonzalez from Colorado, as well as Nico Reed. So there's obviously some continuity there. And then he's really solidified himself, Spencer, I think, as one of the best developers of the position. And I think we were starting to see kind of the bigger picture with him as far as just his guys getting into that cornerback room and, and really uh, flourishing. Uh, if you're looking at some of the people that he's brought in, Kyrie Jackson looks like the the most recent guy that's going to be heading to the NFL. But he was a really good piece of this Oregon staff and uh, a huge part of Oregon's recruiting efforts in Southern California. And he'd already been pretty much at all the big schools in the Pac-12 before he got to Oregon. So I think that this move makes sense for him staying in the Big Ten or going to the Big Ten, however you want to view that, since Oregon's going to the Big Ten. Uh, this was a move that I had heard about, um, something that could be coming for, man, multiple weeks, if not you know a month. So wasn't super surprised that, that this one went down. Uh, obviously, like you mentioned, with him being a Spartan, I think it makes a lot of sense, and it's a really good move for Jonathan Smith. But now we're trying to wait and see kind of what's next for Oregon as far as who gets that new cornerbacks title, uh, whether that be somebody from within, like you mentioned uh, with Zenitz uh, reporting that uh, Oregon graduate assistant Rashad Wadud, uh, it looks like he is going to be in line for a promotion. I know he's kind of been involved uh, with the cornerbacks during his time there. Obviously also a tremendous piece of that recruiting staff. Um, so we'll wait to see what ultimately gets announced, but I think the idea of potentially promoting a guy like Rashad Wadud would be really, really helpful for the Ducks, and I think it just speaks to the health of the program and, and where they're at if you do end up promoting a guy like him from within to that cornerback's job. Yeah, it looks like that's going to be the move, and, and I think that as Oregon fans, we, we should have faith in Dan Lanning and the coaching moves he's made. I mean, if you look at the hires he's made, the staffs that he's put together in his two seasons in Eugene, legitimate question here, Max, who's the worst hire? Doesn't uh, necessarily mean bad that. hire, but like, who's the guy having the least amount of success? I mean, I don't, I don't even know. I, I mean... Like, it's hard to go there because then it, it's like you're talking negatively about somebody. But everything has been so good. I, I, I legitimately don't know what the answer to that question would be. I, I mean, I don't know. Drew Maringer at tight end, I guess. But Kenyon Sadiq has been really like, – like, if that's the lowest possible bar, that's such a high bar for your assistance. Because when you're grading these position coaches as a fan, you should look at the talent and the production. And the tight ends have been talented and productive for Oregon. And, and then they bring in Sali, Sali Apaga uh, in, in the 2024 cycle as well. Sure, Casey Kelly hits the portal, but T. Ferg's coming back. Patrick Herbert's coming back. Kenyon Sadiq. I think Kenyon Sadiq could pop next year. I think one of my early bold takes is that he'll be the number two tight end by the end of the season. I, I think that guy is really, really good and, and is going to be really good. So... I think that for the Ducks, their, their staff has just been competent across the board. You look at the way Junior Adams has brought guys in, recruited, and developed. You look at what Coach Meat did. You look at what Tony Tuioti's done along the defensive line. And Tosh Lupoy and Dan Lanning are involved in defensive line recruiting as well. I think, that, I think that's kind of the centerpiece of you know Oregon recruiting nowadays is bringing in high-level defensive linemen because that's what Lanning wants to build. He wants to have a great defense, and you can't do that without a great defensive front. So I, I, I think these guys have just all done such a fantastic job. I mean, Carlos Lachlan at running backs, gosh, that guy that guy is really good and really, really well thought of. Uh, and and that, that, that certainly matters because it's a testament to the, the caliber of coach that, that he is. But, you know, I, I can't think of over the last two years what I would far and away say is the weakest position group for the Ducks. I mean – I don't know what it is, but that's testament to Dan Lanning. Part of being a head coach, especially in today's world, you got to be able to make good hires. You got to be able to replace guys, and you you have to be able to adapt to a changing circumstance. And Lanning showed that he can do that. So um, obviously, you'd rather keep Coach Meat because of the recruiting potential that he has shown. But if Lanning feels that this is the right move, I trust him. And Dan Lanning has proven to be a really really strong hirer. I don't know what the right word of that is, but maybe just identifying yeah, I talent, whether we're talking players or coaches, he has really excelled. Uh, you talk about 
tabbing Alik Terry as the successor for Adrian Clem, and then there's virtually no drop off, if anything else, a step up in offensive line production from a season ago. So he certainly well, the 2022 that- line was better, but they had it was a different if it was a different lineup of guys. Sure. So I I think the 2022 line was better, but for there to have been such little drop off is a testament to what Terry did. They're they're recruiting that position well. I, I I think that he's he's done a fantastic job in that move. You know he he's gotten some national buzz on you know one of the top coaches uh, who's a position coach under 30. He deserves it because they they were a really good. They were one of the what 12, 16 finalists for the Joe Moore Award this year. That's not bad for a guy's first season when you were working in a new center and a new left tackle. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then just on the topic of youth, if Wadu does indeed get this promotion, I think it speaks to the faith that Lanning has in his guys, even if it is someone who is on the younger side uh, and maybe doesn't have as much of a track record as some of these other coaches do. But, you know, he, he has the amount of times that that guy has been spoken of in the football circles around here in Southern California, like his, his family is like royalty down here in Southern California. So Wadud is incredibly well respected and thought of and an ace of a recruiter as well. Staying on the topic of the coaching moves, Spencer, we had a couple more that were also reported by, by Zenitz. Um, it looks like with Martin moving to Michigan state, there's going to be some more movement, but positive movement, I guess you could say on the Oregon coaching staff with uh, Dimitri, or sorry, with Chris Hampton, set to be promoted to defensive backs coach, which I guess is more of a broad role working with both the corners and uh, the safeties is, is my assumption. But I had a source tell me that that uh, he turned down the Missouri defensive coordinator job in, in order to stay at Oregon and, and keep this position and stay with the Ducks. So I think that speaks to just the direction of where Oregon is going right now and how bought in this staff is right now to to potentially you know turn down an opportunity like that just to continue being a part of what the ducks have been building here and i feel like you've been a big chris hampton fan since he got since he got hired coming over from tulane yeah i was and i think that the reason i felt that way and continue to feel that way is that guy was going from being a dc at a school that just had its best season ever out of the american conference winning the cotton bowl against usc i i think that the fact that he was a co-defensive coordinator on the surface is kind of strange. You know, it's one thing if he were a position coach at Tulane and, and went to be the co-defensive coordinator, but for him to be the full-time DC and go be the co-DC, I, I think this is a testament to something I talked about at the time of the move, which was he's going to play a significant role. I think he did play a significant role. There was a lot of progress in this defense. Now, there were better players there, there was a better pass rush for Oregon throughout the course of the season, save for the Washington game when you're going up against what was deemed to be the best offensive line in all of college football, and Jordan Birch goes down in, in that second game as well. I, I think that Hampton was really involved. We'll never get an answer from Dan Lanning about that, and I totally understand it, and that's that, that's okay. But my, my suspicion is that Hampton was brought on and is remaining on because he is heavily involved as the defensive play caller that that that's that's my theory because Lanning does not call the defensive plays I wanted him to when he came over from Georgia but he's found a guy I think who is is, is really good and, and Tosh Lupoy deserves a lot of credit for the defensive growth as well but when you have a coach come in who was a DC to be the co-DC and your points per game average goes from 27 down to 17 that, that leads me to believe that that guy knows what he is doing when it comes to calling plays on Saturdays, which is usually something you think about on on offense. So I think the I think the better personnel is a part of it. I, I think Hampton is kind of an under the radar architect of Oregon having such a great defense this year. They were one of a few schools to have a top three or rather a top ten offense and defense in all of college football this season. So I, I think the Ducks are in a really, really good spot. I like Chris Hampton. And, you know, hearing him turn down Power 5 offers like Missouri, for instance, it's not surprising to me that he's been offered those sorts of roles. But Dan Lanning just showed that Oregon is a destination place to be. I, I mean, there are just not that many places you'd rather go. And, 
you know, Missouri is certainly not uh, the caliber of, of football brand and power that Oregon is. They had a great season. They won 11 games. Eli Drinkowitz, good football coach over there in the SEC. But I don't think Missouri is the sort of place that you go if – uh, to be a DC, if you were already heavily involved at a place like Oregon, which he is, I, I think he'd wait for a job, you know, to maybe open up in in, in the Big Ten I, I, or you know a bigger SEC team if one of those opportunities came about. But I'm happy that he's staying on, and I love the continuity on this staff. The continuity with the players is about as much as Duck fans could have asked for. You know, you're losing Bo Nix and Bucky and Troy and uh, Kyrie Jackson to the NFL you're always going to lose some players and those are big time impact guys, all conference, all American selections, but to bring back guys like Birch and Bossa and uh, Taishim and, and there are just a bunch of other dudes out there. I, I, I think that that is a testament to what Oregon's got going and how everyone feels internally about what 2024 can be. I think it's uh, fair to say that you can consider both Spencer and I fans of the uh, members of the Chris Hampton fan club, um, just the last thing to note here is uh, Zenit's also reported that analyst Brian Michalowski, Michalowski is uh, expected to take on a bigger role. So uh, things are on the up and up as far as the defensive staff at Oregon, uh, despite losing a guy who is as well respected and accomplished as Demetrius Martin. Don't go anywhere. We got more Oregon football talk for you after the break. Welcome back to the Ducks Dish Podcast. I'm your host, Max Torres, talking with my guy, Spencer McLaughlin. It's always a good day when we're talking some Duck football, Spencer. You know how it is. Um, let's talk about a little bit of portal action because, oh boy, has the portal been hopping. Probably the understatement of the century, but massive, massive shakeup across college football with Kalen DeBoer taking the Washington, sorry, taking the Alabama head coaching job and then Jed Fish becoming his successor at Washington. We're seeing tons of movement from both of those guys, both of those schools, rather. Caleb Downs is the most recent guy from the Tide to hit the portal. Caden Proctor is also spoke, uh, supposed to hit the portal. Let's talk about one of the biggest targets that's still on Oregon's radar, Spencer, and that is Washington corner Jabbar Muhammad. He was an all-Pac-12 selection this past season, originally from DeSoto, Texas. Uh, can confirm that he is going to be at the University of Texas today for a visit, but we have Oregon and Alabama also in the mix, and it looks like this one is going to come together very quickly as far as when a decision is ultimately going to be made by Jabbar Muhammad, but can we just talk about how huge of a addition this could potentially be if the Ducks are able to pull it off? Yeah, I mean, let, let's be frank about it. He had the clamps on Troy Franklin in the Pac-12 title game. I, I mean, this is a guy who's got elite coverage skills in, in a man-to-man -man defense, and that's something we saw a lot more of from the, the defensive staff for the Ducks in 2024, I think, or in 2023, rather, because I think they trusted their corners a lot more. I think last season, you know, they trusted Gonzo, first rounder in the NFL draft, obviously, but I think there were a lot of zone calls in in the 2023 can, or 2022 campaign rather compared to 2023 because they didn't feel like they had the dudes to play man-to-man -man coverage but if you want to play a lot of press man yeah Jabbar Muhammad is a guy who can do that uh, I mean he he was fantastic for Washington this year he was great in the playoff game and in the Pac-12 title game he, he's just really really good uh he, he's physical fast good ball skills as well, I, I know that's been a point of frustration with Duck fans at times with, with a couple corners, specifically Dante Manning, who feels like he's always in the right position, never getting beat, and then passes are caught because he's just not able to find the ball. I don't think Muhammad's got that sort of problem. He, he's got great anticipation, great ball skills, just a really talented player. And, you know, a guy who Oregon would bring in and it, it would be make the cornerbacks room even more crowded. You could see some spring departures, I think, if Muhammad were to enter in because there just wouldn't be enough room for for everyone to play as much as they want to. But, you know, right now I think you're looking at a starting cornerback tandem. I would guess, and this is a guess, I would guess your top two corners are Cam Alexander from UTSA and Jaleel Florence. That, again, that's a guess. Now, how many corners do you need? To be able to play, probably what? up to five. 
yeah, pro- probably up to five. You're going to have injuries. Guys will get dinged up. They rotate in and out. You want to have different matchups and such. And Oregon's got a lot of corners with a lot of experience and plenty of talent in there. But if Muhammad were to go in, he'd probably be a starting corner. I, I, I would be hard-pressed to see him not starting, and I wonder how much of an obstacle he sees that being. Because if he were to go to a place like Texas, their secondary was terrible this year. They were one of the worst pass defenses, I think, in the country, Penix torched him for 430 in, in the Sugar Bowl. And it's not as if Penix was bad against Oregon in his two games, but he didn't go for 430. And Muhammad, I think, would be a guaranteed starter there. I think he would be at Oregon too, but there's just there, there are more guys pushing for playing time. And I, I think that Muhammad would be a great addition. I mean, if your top four corners on your 2D are Muhammad on one side, Florence on the other, Cam Alexander, and then Sione Lalea, maybe, or Dante Manning. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how much better you're, you're going to get right there. And I, I am curious to see with all the corners they have in the room and the relatively fewer number of safeties they have in a five defensive back look, I wonder if they aren't going to play more next season with three corners on the field rather than three safeties. It's definitely something I think that could be a possibility just when you look at the numbers and then the, the need for guys that can cover uh, Kobe Savage obviously comes in. And I think that they would still probably like to get a safety if possible, but I, yeah, it's, it's pretty clear to me that I think a guy like Jabbar Muhammad doesn't come to Oregon to not start. I mean, that's just usually how transfer portal recruitments work. Right. But I had an interview with Jabbar. You can read the full interview over on DucksDigest.com for free with quotes but I asked him what stands out about Oregon, and I want to read what he had to say. Uh, he said, Coach Lanning. Coach Lanning and that defensive staff are honestly just building something really good there. They got the pass rush. They got the backers. They got the DBs. They got everything you need to be successful. And like I said, that's kind of exact. That's kind of like exactly what I'm looking for at the end of the day. They have stability there. Obviously, with Coach Lanning turning down jobs and everything, Oregon's building something really special. They have a lot of firepower with the quarterback. They had a lot of. They have a lot of returning players. And they're going to be one of the top teams in the country next year. So I think Oregon's got a really good shot here, Spencer. There's been buzz about uh, another visit to Alabama potentially coming on Friday. I think he's Uh, visiting Texas as we speak. He's he's in he's at Texas today. That's right. Um, But uh, given how quickly this one's coming together, I think getting him on campus is going to be super important. I think uh, the Texas ties could be really difficult to overcome for Oregon. He's got his cousin Malik Muhammad already on the team. Uh, he was a true freshman last year, I believe. He's also got a, a cousin, I was told, on the on the basketball team, on the women's basketball team. Uh, he's from Texas, so you just look at the logistics of family being able to come see. So uh, I think that it's obviously all trending in the right way for Texas, but do not count out Oregon here. Uh, I think that uh, if anyone's done that in the past, they've seen that that can be a mistake. They are able to get, they're at least able to get involved with anybody that they want. But keep an eye on Jabbar Muhammad. Last point for us here, Spencer, that I wanted to kind of pick your brain on. Given all the losses that Oregon had on defense this past year, is it crazy? How crazy, if at all, do you think it is to think that this defense could be even better next year? even better i don't know doorless is such a high impact guy i mean he was oregon's leader in sacks and also if i bet if you were to find these analytics numbers i bet you he led the ducks in number of 1v1s that he won early he had the highest win rate percentage when going to get after a passer i wouldn't be surprised if he led the ducks in pressures as well I, i think the jamari caldwell edition is a good one I don't know if I can expect him to immediately be Brandon Dorless, who, you know, Caldwell was second team all Big 12. Well, Dorless was first team all Pac-12. The Pac-12 was a better conference top to bottom. And I, I just look at what, you know, the defense was this past season. I think it was good enough to take Oregon where they wanted to go. And their their inability to execute on those two particular game days, they still only lost the games by three points. I, I just don't think that... Oregon's defense needs to make a big jump forward you know obviously you'd take better if you can get it I I just don't know how with the personnel they have that you you look at it and say well it's better than the than the last season like let's say Cam Alexander comes in and he's good 
Well, would he be as good as Kyrie Jackson? Okay, great. Well, that's not an upgrade. I, I, I don't know that Cam Alexander is capable of being better than Kyrie Jackson. I don't know if Sione Lale is coming in and capable of being better than Kyrie Jackson. I don't know if Jamari Caldwell can come in and be better than Brandon Dorless. So I, I look across the, the secondary. I think you can get better production from the safety spot. That's the only place where I say, okay, Kobe Savage back there could be better than any safety Oregon had on the field, including Evan Williams, who was very good in, in 2023. That's the only spot where I can see an upgrade. The other guys, I think, can be as good as the guys they're brought in to replace. I just don't have anything to indicate that they would be you know, dramatically better, which is what you need. Like If you compare Oregon's 2022 defense to 2023, You've got individual players that are better. You've got uh, more talent at certain positions. I think that that was absolutely a big upgrade. You look at like Jaleel Florence getting better. You look at Kyrie Jackson being really good and that, you know, replacing most of uh, what Christian Gonzalez was the year prior. I think the safeties got better. I think the linebackers were better. Jeffrey Bossa was a much better player. Your defensive line was deeper and more talented. I don't see it being that big of a shift. So if Oregon's defense can just be as good as it was this year, they can win the Big Ten. Absolutely. I would definitely agree with that. And I think a reason to think that they could take another step forward, maybe it's not massive because, like you said, they were really good last year. It's just another year, another offseason in that system. I think that was one of the reasons we saw them take a leap last year was that they were more comfortable in the system, and Dan had his guys in that system. I think a lot of people that I've talked to have kind of talked about how Noah Sewell maybe wasn't the best fit for that Dan Lanning defense. But but now it feels like they are getting those guys, getting someone like Jordan Birch, Jeffrey Bossa back. I think that is going to be huge. You have those guys from the 23 class that got to, what was that word? Marinate last year. I used that again yesterday. So feeling feeling good about that one. But And then some 2024 guys that could come in and have an instant impact. You never know. But uh, I think there is plenty of intrigue around this group and I think everything's going according to plan if I'm Dan Lanning and the Ducks right now Spencer I want to get you out of here but before we do that let the people know where they can find you because you're not smalls underscore 55 anymore we got a new name that we're rocking with on x Yes, indeed. At S. McLaughlin CFB is the handle host of Locked On College Football now, formerly Locked On Pac-12, talking about the biggest stories and the greatest sport on planet Earth. It is something that uh, I'm really, really excited about, love doing. Already got several episodes up, so go check them out if you have not already. And if you, here, here's the biggest reason you should go follow the show. If you are finding it difficult to keep track of the major transfers in college football and the coaching carousel. And when it's in the news realignment, that's what we're talking about over on Locked On College Football. So stoked about that. And Max, always good to come on with you. Absolutely. Well, you guys, make sure you lock in with Spencer. He is one of the best in the biz. And even though he's technically, I guess, one of my competitors, he's definitely one of my best buddies in this space. And he does some awesome work. So make sure you lock in with him. If you want to lock in with me, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at mtaurus sports. Subscribe to my YouTube channel at Oregon Football Max Taurus and read all of my written work over on ducksdigest.com. But until next time, a big thank you to Spencer and a big thank you to you guys for tuning in wherever you're tuned in and taking some time out of your day to talk some Oregon football. And we will see you in the next episode of the Ducks Dish Podcast.